Uh, how is everybody? I'm Eric Fox with Reese Broom. We're a law firm out of Tyson's Corner and we practice in community associations, condominiums, homeowners associations, uh, it's one of our largest groups of clients through the firm. Um, I'm a Northern Virginia native. So, yep, grew up over in Mount Vernon area and have uh, moved back after being gone for about 20 years. So, no, supply my own. So, um, I've been asked to talk about associations and how to help make the decisions within associations and provide an outline of that with as many of you who responded that are already members of the boards or members of the landscape committee. Um, a lot of the slides that I have are kind of out of place because you already know so much. Aim for a little bit more remedial audience. Um, but associations, and whether they're homeowners associations or condo associations, you also have some civic associations, uh, a lot of those over in the Arlington area. But they're either mandatory, such as your HOAs and your condos, or voluntary, such as civic associations. But they all operate under the same general premises. And one thing to think about your um, voluntary associations, look at other places where you can work in the natives. And this would be um, churches, if you're members of church groups and you have any area that you control any lands on the church. You can also work your natives in there. Um, volunteers at the boys and girls clubs, they have property where these things can be worked in. So just something else to think of other than just straight HOAs and condominium associations. Um, all of the associations are typically going to operate the same way. They have enabling legislation, just like the Constitution. Um, you have your Declaration of Covenants Restrictions. Sometimes it's called a Deed of Dedication um, on the older associations. But that is kind of the overall rules for living with on the, within the property. You have your operational documents. And those are your bylaws and articles of incorporation. This is how the association is going to operate, how we're going to hold our meetings, where our officers are going to be. And one thing that you'll see a lot of times when it comes to condominiums is there's a combination between the declaration and the bylaws. So the declaration is limited, typically limited to here's what a unit is, here's what the unit's defined as, look for everything else in the bylaws, and then the bylaws have that mix of operational as well as the restrictions on how you can use the property. So you're going to pull from all of these documents depending on what you need and what you're trying to get done. Now, rules and regulations, those are what are adopted by the board. So they have your landscape guidelines, your um, collection resolutions, these sorts of things. These are how the association is going to operate. And those are adopted by the board. They're repealed by the board, amended by the board. So these are the documents that are a lot easier for the board to change. They've got to, your rules and regulations, your resolutions, they have to relate or have originating authority coming out of the declaration if you want to enforce them. Um, a large case not too long ago, just this past fall, they got decided out in Loudoun County, people had Christmas light, well, sorry, colorful lights up on their trees all year round. And it was, you know, the judge said, the documents don't stop you from having lights on trees. It had st they stop you. They let you adopt a rule that says you can't broadcast a light onto another house, but not just a general um, and, um, ambiguity of light coming off the property. It wouldn't let them restrain. So you've got to have. If you're going to adopt rules, well, if you're going to enforce rules, they've got to harken back to your declaration. Um, the hierarchy of your documents, of course, you have the statutes that are adopted by the state, then your articles of incorporation, again, those are, if you're incorporated, and those are mainly operational documents. Here's how we're going to establish, here's where our classes of voting members are. Uh, your bylaws, they talk about your meetings. This is where you determine what quorum for an annual meeting is, where you get your, how you have to set your proxies. Can somebody come in with a proxy written on a napkin, or does it have to be on a board-approved form? A lot of the ones that usually catch people are, if you're a resident, you can't bring in more than two or three proxies, and board members can bring in as many proxies as they want. So those kinds of things come out of the bylaws, how those meetings operate. 
Then you have the Declaration of Covenants. And this is the one that is typically recorded in the land records for homeowners associations. So these are the ones that the judges pay most attention to when they're having you go ahead or when you're having a case about enforcement of, you know, is there grass too tall? Is there, you know, something wrong with the property? So those are the ones that they look at as the declaration. And then if you've adopted any rules, did it come directly from authority in the declaration? Uh, your design guidelines, those can be adopted either by the architectural committee, the design committee. Um, your declaration will say if you're if you have mandatory committees or voluntary committees, uh, set out what those committees will be. But your design guidelines, remember, it's a guideline. I see these all the time for associations that says, you shall have a wood pile that is no more than four feet tall and three feet wide. And there's absolutely nothing in the declaration that says you have the right to limit a wood pile. You have the right to um, adopt rules regarding exterior maintenance of the property kind of a long stretch between exterior maintenance and the dimension of a wood pile or in, in implementing native plant as a requirement for people. But your guidelines are a great place to go and say, here's a preferred list of plants. Here are things that we want to see planted throughout our community and to kind of encourage them and introduce people to what those plants may be. Um, your board of directors runs the affairs of the association. The committees get designated. Everybody should try to be on a landscape committee if this is your interest. And because the landscape committee is typically going to adopt the guidelines, or not adopt the guidelines, they suggest the guidelines to the board who then adopts them. So if you're on that landscape committee, go ahead and revise your design guidelines that, you know, let's go ahead and incorporate these um, native plantings or promote them with on residential with on the residences. The other thing that you can do is you're in charge of the common area and that's where you can go ahead and start making those changes saying let's put in purple cone flower, let's put in some of these sedges so that we have so that we're incorporating native plants. And for the managers who were asking earlier, you know, how do we do this with the board? You know, find the find the least offensive native plant purple cone flower and just move it in. Prices are the same as any of the commercial perennials. It's something that you can move in quickly, easily. They don't even know that you've got native plants coming in, but you are bringing them into the property. Um, because I red tape, quick dogwood native? Another great plant to just bring into a community. It's not, it's commercially available. It's not a specialty plant. So start moving with small steps and then get them used to the incorporation of native plants. Um, so. If you're on the board of directors, you can you have the charter which establishes what the uh, design or what your landscape committee does. You can go ahead and lay out a directive for them to incorporate native plants into new displays going into the property, into incorporating your signage areas or other areas that you want to incorporate the natives. Design guidelines and resolutions, we've already kind of covered. Those are just the things that the board can adopt, the board can change and make those um, introduce the population, introduce the neighbors to this new idea that we're coming out with. And if you're doing it from the board level, it's very important to communicate with the residents. Go ahead and put in your newsletter, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna adopt a native planning area over in this section. You are going to see X, Y, and Z occurring over here. The communication is the key. Claudia moved, but she's great with getting the communication out and rested. Uh, there she is. So getting signage, the interpretive signage into these areas that let people know what's going on. That, yeah, my meadow looks scraggy from this time frame to this time frame, but we've got to let it go ahead and go to seed and can't pull everything out right away. Um, management companies, they handle the contracts for the associations. You hire the management companies, 
if you tell them that you want to work these into the contracts a requirement for X percentage of native plants, they'll go ahead and do that. They'll make the contacts, they'll find out where these plants are, and they'll get them incorporated into your contracts. Um, ask your contractors how to incorporate, where's a good spot to incorporate. Make sure, I've seen landscape committees that the people know everything about landscaping and yet they're putting a cuba right out in the front sun. So make sure that you're going ahead and talking with the professionals and getting the ideas of where to go ahead and implement these things and to get them implemented the right way. Uh, getting your neighborhood recognized. The Audubon Society will do recognition. Um, they'll do uh, National Wildlife Federation. They'll certify your yard as a wildlife habitat. So these are all things that help. You can get that recognition for your community and the community itself, when people are incorporating natives into their landscapes, they can go ahead and call those people out in the newsletter and say, it's a great job that John Smith has gone ahead and, you know, here's a picture of what he's done with his yard to incorporate native plants. So just doing the recognition is a great way to get people to go ahead and promote this and then they just want to keep up with the Joneses and they'll go ahead and start doing their own plantings. Uh, so really how to get started, incorporate use of natives into your design guidelines. Get them in there, put the list of suggested plants in there so that people know what's available, know what they can use. It's a lot easier to do it as a suggestion to try and force it than to try and force it on people via resolution. Um, incorporate into your landscape contracts, incorporate into your own displays. Very easy way to start getting your plants out there and get the natives um, introduced into your area. Recognize the owners and then explain the benefits to the member or to the membership, why you're doing this, what they're getting out of it, what because they don't understand a lot of time what the benefits are. Um, one of the responses to Renee's poll earlier was reluctant member, reluctant board member, how do we get them to change their mind? If they're dead set against it, you're only going to attack them a little bit at a time. Just get one plan in, then move the next plan in, and it's just a slow progression. So that is all that I have on prepared, but any questions? Yes, sir. So I no, I'm not. I can speak. So, Jay Ensign at Nair Farms HOA. Mm -hmm. You mentioned for enforcement, which is a huge issue for our board, that it needs to be in the declarations which are filed with the land records. So, it's obviously easy to modify, you know, the other documents. But how often, if ever, can a board go back and modify declarations that are filed? Sure. Uh, the question is, how can, how often, or how does a board go about modifying a declaration? Right. And. The answer to that is you can do it as often as you want, but usually to modify a declaration, it's going to require 67% of the membership. And you've got to be careful when you're looking at this, what your specific documents say. Towards the end of your declaration, there's going to be a section called amendments. And it's going to say, by a vote of 67% of the membership, which means everybody. It may say 67% of a quorum of membership at a meeting, which depending on what your quorum requirements are, then has dropped your numbers down. So you've just got to look at what your specific documents say and think of can we get this passed, can we pass the bar that's established in the documents. A lot of times your documents will be two-tiered if the development is less than 20 years old, it may require 75 or 95 percent to change that declaration. So just, it's document specific. Yes, sir. Yeah, I don't believe I need it also. I, going back on what he just asked. So in the HOA, what we have seen, I'm at a Longwood Knowles and the HOA president there, is the growth over years of the electronics going in to yards that you would normally plant trees. So the, the latest was a homeowner who in their front yard wanted to put a dish that was three feet in diameter in the front yard. They had permission from their neighbor, but obviously the neighborhood took issue with that. 
I'm finding more and more, though, there are other rules out there that even counties where commercial companies have come in and have been given leniency in dishes on top of roofs versus things that you can see. Is there anything an HOA can do to limit that kind of growth in the front yard, for, for example, of these facilities that they're building? The electronic facilities? Yes. Um, so there's the, I'm going to call it the Satellite Dish Act, which is the federal act, which says if the satellite dish is under uh, some amount of meters, but essentially 18 inches, which is what you typically see the dish satellites, that the HOA can't regulate them. Um, they can have, you can have a suggestion for placement, but if it significantly interferes with the signal, you can't stop them from putting that in. So I would think a three-foot dish would be something that you might have the ability to regulate if it's within your documents. Your documents would have to say um, something along the lines of, you know, nobody shall have satellite, and there are older documents that say it, you know, no satellite dishes shall go, you know, shall be on the front portion of the property, they have to be in the rear. Uh, so it's just depending on what your documents say as to whether or not it's enforceable. But new technology, now, that wasn't in the old documents, so now we want to put it in the new document. Mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the problem with the 60% thing? That, that's the amendment. You've got to figure out what your percentage is. And you're seeing a lot now with um, solar collectors on roofs. So everybody want, you know, people are looking to put solar panels on. I'm in favor of it myself. It's not the solar panels from the 70s where it took up the whole roof. It's a more attractive design. But there's a restriction in the declaration that says no solar panels. So it becomes going, great, I've got this thing, it's called a solar ball. It's not a panel. And they're probably going to be able to put that in. So you've got to be specific with your language. And the really great thing is, is looking at how language changes and how the court changes language, uh, what the meaning of a simply determined determine that. Simply understood word is. Everybody understood that a solar panel, at the time when all there was was solar panels, meant solar collection device. But now that you have these solar balls, these other solar shingles, the court's saying it's not solar panels, you can stop them, you should use those other words, when those words didn't even exist at the time. Um, some recent legislation that was just shut down out of Loudoun County was single family home. You know, now every single family home is going to be allowed to have an accessory dwelling on it. And so every declaration says, this shall be a single family, you know, restricted use to a single family neighborhood or single family on a lot. And they're going to change the definition of single family meaning two houses now. So it's very difficult to keep up with changes in statutory construction. So you do have to look at doing those amendments to keep that going. The problem is the obviously the numbers. You know, some yes. conditions over 400, getting 400 members, and I'm sure many of us come from HOAs that are well over the hundreds. And, and something to keep in mind when you're doing the amendments, sometimes it's a vote, sometimes it's a document signed by. So if it's 67% of a vote, you've got to get all those people together. If it's 67% of a document signed by, you've got to go start knocking on doors and make sure that you can get your 67% that way. Um, this, yes ma'am. Hi, um, I had a question about, um, hi. Um, I'm the, on the condo board for Jefferson Park condominiums, and we're a small neighborhood, mm -hmm. but we have these annoying medians between our driveways. They're tiny, but they're considered common elements. But okay. people, prior to me moving in, have done their own things, treated them as like a mini garden, like they plant tomatoes, but you know, one person doesn't like the tomatoes, and you know, all that fun stuff. So um, I want to just kind of, you know, put the axe down and say nobody can do individual planting anymore because these are common elements. The condo association will control what is planted if anything is planted. Is that recommended? I'm not recommending anything, but if you mean is it permissible? <laughs> um, most likely it is. If, that, if it's a common element, unless it's restricted as a limited common element reserved to the people to do what they want to do, if it's a common element, it is under the control, most likely, uh, of the condominium association. And so you can make the determination as to what gets planted in those strips. Going back to the dish situation, um, 
where does it fall when you have two or more dishes on the house? Because people will not remove the old dish and then they just install a new dish. And there are some many properties that have like two or three dishes on the house because they don't want to remove the old one because it's on the roof and if they remove it then there's going to be holes. Right. So how does that all work out? Um, I'm not sure. I haven't had to deal with the issue before. Um, you, know, you have to let them install the dish. You know, may, it might be possible within your rules to require removal of a dish after it's no longer active. So that may be a way that you could look at doing that. You just, you've got to look at your declaration and see if you have that authority. Because you can't stop them from putting the new dish in. But you maybe have the authority to go ahead and have them pull the old dishes out. Sorry, it's not a great answer. It is a document specific answer. Uh, let me go ahead. Um, they're going to be read in conjunction, and for the most part, you know, there would be some, the statutes would most likely overrule. Yeah. Okay. So. Yes, sir. Just to follow on to your comment about the 67%, so a few recommendations how to deal with communities that have an extremely high percentage of rental properties where I have absentee owners who simply don't respond and don't do anything? Um, Okay, you've got to look at, okay, what kind of amenities does your community offer? So we've got pot lots, we've got a pool, we've got pool. Two common areas. Yep. Great, you want your pool passes? <laughs> really? Take, take a pro send, send them a proxy form when it's time to fill out their pool passes. Really? Yep. Proxy form's good for, you know, unless your documents say a time less, it's good for a year. Wow. So... Are you an incorporated association? Yes. Okay. So it should be good for around a year or so. You can do it in the pool pass time. So you're getting your, well, you have your pool passes going out in May, April, and your annual meetings in November or January. Collect your proxies then. How about the like parking permits and stuff like that? Is that yes, absolutely. Hey, you're here to get your parking permits. Great. Let's go ahead and, you know, are you going to make the annual meeting? No. Can we get your, can we get your proxy? For quorum purposes only. This just means that we haven't been able to have a meeting in the last 15 years. And we need to do an election, we need to do these things. Can we go ahead and get your quorum, your proxy quorum? So, and all it says is you were there so we could do an election that we haven't been able to do in several years. So, if you can tie it to an amenity, pools, parking, um, that's a good way to go ahead and promote getting proxies. All right. If there's no more questions, I think it wraps this up. Thank you.